I got a question. It's an important question. In fact, it's really pivotal to the life that we might be able to live. And the question is, do you know what time it is? I'm not talking about the time that, you, that is showing on your, uh, on your watch or in front of your uh, smartphone. No, 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 no. I'm talking about something beyond that. I'm talking about, do you know what time it is in light of the world in which we live today, in light of all that is going on in our society? Do you know what time it is? Do you know what time it is in light of what, is God, what God is doing in the midst of our society, what God is up to? In these moments, do you know what time it is in light of the season of life that you're in? Do you know what time it is? You see, understanding the time is absolutely critical, and it's a beginning point of living the life God created each and every one of us to live because we don't want to miss our moments, do we? Because, come on, is it just me, or have you looked at 2020, and this is a year of crazy? I'm like, what? Everybody talked about 2020 vision, right? We're going to have a 2020 vision for the year. It's a scary vision, isn't it? It's like, what in the world? All the things that could go wrong has gone wrong, and we're like, I don't want to look at this anymore. <laughs> and yet, we need to recognize the time, nonetheless, because while it's tempting for us to shrink, while it's tempting for us to sit back and go, oh, I just want things to go back to normal. But life is wasted in the process. And here's what I know about you. If you're a guest with us this morning, I'm so glad you're here. We really are. In fact, we exist for Jesus, and we exist for people who don't know Jesus yet. And if you're a guest here, we're so delighted that you're here, and we're so delighted for many of you who are joining us online right now. I'm grateful that you're here. And I know that each and every one of us, regardless if we're Christ followers or not, we don't want to waste our one and only life, do we? None of us do. So how do we avoid it? In fact, how do we, instead of wasting our lives, find ourselves caught up in something just bigger than the circumstantial stuff that might be going on? What if we can get caught up in something larger? What if we can get caught up in what the Bible talks about, which is the great rescue mission that he is engaged in right now? In fact, there's a revolution that Jesus himself has started. And and what he's trying to do, and he will do in time, completely reclaim the world. And so what we are have the privilege and the invitation to do is to seek God's kingdom. And what that means is to devote ourselves to what Jesus wants, to to engage in what Jesus cares about. It means to find out what Jesus wants us to do and willingly join in with them to do it. It's about aligning our lives with his agenda and letting his agenda, that agenda, Becoming our agenda. And some of you are thinking, well, what's that agenda? Well, the agenda is really very, very clear. First and foremost, the agenda is to reach out to a lost and dying world with the one and only message that can transform someone's eternity. It's a mission so clear and so vital that Jesus spelled it out for us before he went back to heaven. In fact, over the thousands of years, We can only call it the Great Commission. And within that Great Commission includes a cultural commission in which we are able to live a life that makes a difference in the world that we live. And the unique ways that he's gifted us and the unique talents and and aptitudes and personalities. and, 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 And so we leverage those things in the various aspects of life to bring about a transformation that is reflecting more of God, his goodness, his righteousness. And we do it in various forms, be it politically, uh, law enforcement, education, in the media, on and on and on. The options are varied and many. But one of the things that we need to recognize is that this importance of understanding our times is really vital. Here's why. Because you and I, thank you, pardon me. Hi, camera. 
Um, we don't, it's simply, God didn't create us simply to live out years. No. In fact, Scripture describes Christ followers nothing short of a revolutionary. In fact, following Jesus means that in the best sense, we are radical. And in the best sense, we are called to be a dangerous people. Again, for the good of the world and for the glory of Jesus. That's at least a biblical understanding. And throughout history, we've seen evidence of how Christ followers have indeed made a difference. In fact, Christians, Christ followers are called to make history. See, we need to understand the time because we're living in a pivotal moment, if you haven't noticed. Our nation is in a very pivotal place. And the question is, can we make history for the sake and the cause of Jesus, for the good of the world and for his glory? Because like I said, in the pages of history, we've seen evidence of how Jesus has equipped and empowered his followers indeed to make history. For example, in ancient history, Christ followers brought a stop to infanticide, ended slavery, liberated women, established orphanages, created schools and hospitals and various places around the world. During the medieval era, Christ followers kept classical culture alive through the copying of manuscripts and, and building of libraries and the invention of colleges and universities. And in the modern era that just ended, Christ followers led the way to, de to the development and the furtherance of science and, and the political and economic freedoms amongst very various places in the world and provided what is arguably the greatest source of inspiration for art, literature, and music the world has ever known. And the question is, what would those of us who follow Jesus in our day do? What are we going to do with the time that we have right now. And the great danger is nothing. So how is that prevented? Well, first of all, it's nothing that something someone can just grant us or, or, or just place in our laps. No, no, no. It needs to be an absolute choice that we make to be in concert with a vibrant and personal relationship with Jesus Christ and a commitment and have a resolve that we will make our lives count, that we will stand up and be counted and make history. <laughs> and there's not a single person, it doesn't matter if you're a Christ follower or not, like I mentioned, that doesn't want their life to be counted. You want your one and only life to count, but what does that look like? What does that mean? What does that entail? What steps do we need to take? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at one of the most engaging and, and, and shivering, uh, stirring and pivoting events of recorded history. And it revolves around a young woman by the name of Esther in the Old Testament. Just give you a background. Esther was a Jewish woman who lived in Persia, and she was a descendant of Jews who were, who were being carried away into exile by King Nebuchadnezzar. And that was the king of Babylon back then. And more important than the social, political background, what was interesting is that she was born an orphan. What resonates to us is the fact that she was in a situation and in a position where she had absolutely zero advantage. She had everything going against her, especially in those times. Because being an orphan was a, basically a sentence to a life of, of nothingness. But fortunately for her, she was raised by her cousin by the name of Mordecai, who was a very good and godly man. And he loved and cared for Esther and raised her as he would his own daughter. And here's what we read in the book of Esther in the Old Testament. She grew to become an incredibly beautiful woman, both inside and out. So physically beautiful, in fact, that when the king of Persia searched his entire empire for a new wife, she was the one who won the beauty contest. She was it. 
No one was more attractive and desirable than her. And so she was elected to be queen. And no one suspected she was a Jew. Because Mordecai wisely advised her to say, that's not important. That's not, you need to keep that hidden for a while. Now, the story unpacks for us that not only did Esther come into an incredible position, but the book of Esther tells us there was an evil man by the name of Haman. He appears in the scene, and he was gaining the king's confidence. And have you ever met some of those guys that just has a way of, first of all, he was a wormy kind of dude, you know, kind of slimy character, you know, hyper-ego kind of person. You guys know what I'm talking about? He weaseled himself in, angled and maneuvered his way to a high position, so much so that king allowed him to be honored in this way. He commanded that all the royal officials and the people, that whenever he would go, wherever he would go, and whenever he was present, that people will kneel down before Haman. Now, wherever Haman went... Everyone knelt down before Haman. Everyone except Mordecai. Now, Mordecai, he would not bow down because he understood then what we need to understand now as followers of the Lord. See, he understood that the only authority, the ultimate authority, is the Lord himself. And that means we ought not to bow down to any person, any group, any ideology, anything. Only the Lord deserves the place of ultimate authority in our lives. And as you can imagine, this infuriated a prideful man like Haman. In fact, he was so angry by the fact that Mordecai would not bow that he decided not just to kill him, but he chose to wipe out the entire Jewish race. So here's what he did. He started a campaign to deceive the king into believing all kinds of horrible things about the Jews who were living in the kingdom. See, he convinced that the king, that, that, that the Jews were those subversive, undermining people. In fact, their way of life, their way of thinking was the source of everything that is wrong in their society. That's what he connivingly did before the king. And so what he did, once he had the his king all angry and worked up, he convinced him to sign an edict that would reward anyone who would kill a Jewish person a reward of money. Haman knew that if people would be financially rewarded for killing a Jewish person, it would be long, it wouldn't be long rather, before all the Jewish people would be hunted down and killed. Now, that's the backdrop of the story that we're about to step into. See, what here in that context, we're going to discover how Esther's life teaches us in regards to understanding our time and making history with our lives. Like I said, it's not a time to shrink back. It's time to stand up and be counted. So you ready to make history? Are you ready to make history? That was kind of lame. So let me prompt you better. And this is not just for Aurora, but let me ask you sincerely. Do you want to make history with your life? Esther's life, God's word, shows us how. In Esther chapter 4, beginning of verse 1, it reads, When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. And he went on as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews. With fasting and weeping and wailing, many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuch and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of a sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. 
So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, which, by the way, is the capital of Persia, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And she told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Now, I want to pause here. Because it kind of illustrates what of some of what I shared with in terms of context, but it also unpacks for us the first key in making history with our lives. And the first key is this: opportunity. Opportunity. We must be willing to see and seize the opportunity that is before us. You see, Esther suddenly find her, found herself not only in a unique position of influence, but with a unique situation to, uh, that allowed her to make a difference with her life. Because Mordecai told Esther, here's your opportunity in our time of need. Now, seize it. Stand up to it. Go for it. And by the way, she's not alone. The fact is, in your life and in mine, we have countless opportunities presented to us by God to do something significant in this world with our lives. Because at various points and times, God would inject moments into the ebb and flow of our lives to do something special if we will be attentive. And some of those things are life-changing, perhaps world-changing. See, moments in time that are of a divine nature, supernatural in potential, and eternal in significance. In fact, the Bible has a word for such moments. They are called Kairos moments. See, that's an idea that is often lost in our world but was keenly understood in ages past. Because the ancient Greeks, for example, the, the Greek language had two principal words for time. One was chronos, and that's where we got our English word chronological, right? It depicts a calendar time of days, weeks, months, years, chronology. But then they had a second word for time, and that word is Kairos, and a word that meant something radically different than chronos. It's something deeper. It, in fact, we don't have an adequate English uh, equivalent for it, but it has more to do with the quality of time. See, it's a moment pregnant with eternal significance and possibility. In fact, it's a moment that when we are confronted with a choice or a decision, it has a potential within it if we will take action. Kairos holds the deepest level of significance for who we are, who we're becoming, and what our life impact can be. And that sense of time filled is filled with opportunity. And that sense of time that of Kairos is really displayed throughout the pages of Scripture. For example, in the Old Testament, when the prophet Jeremiah talked about the life of Pharaoh of Egypt... Jeremiah spoke of this Pharaoh, his life being just like a vapor or like a, like a puff of air or loud noise, if you will, and nothing more. Why? Because he had missed his kairos. He had missed his moment. So even though he was the Pharaoh over Egypt, because he missed his kairos, his life was inconsequential. There are many examples. And a New Testament example is this. There's a scene toward the end of Jesus' life where he comes to a ridge overlooking Jerusalem. And the Bible says that he breaks down and weeps. Why? Scripture tells us it was because that the people, his people, did not recognize the time appointed to them. In other words, they didn't recognize the kairos of the moment of God coming to them. They didn't recognize that Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't recognize that Jesus was about to go to the cross to, to die for the sins of the world. They didn't recognize the significance of the moment, and it broke the Lord's heart. And in many ways, our entire life on this planet is a kairos moment. Every bit of it, really, from birth to, to death. But the question is whether we will see opportunities that God brings our way or not. Because truth be told, 
Most people don't. Why is that? Well, I've heard one person explain it like this. You see, imagine, if you will, a line that is taut that stretches across this room. You got it in your head? It's a line. It's like a big, thin wire, but it's strong. It's tight. It goes across the room and extends past the room, past the parking lot, past the property, past the neighborhoods, past the county, past the state, past the country, around the world, but beyond the world into the atmosphere, into the space, and stretches all the way out infinitum into the universe. Can you imagine that? You got the picture? You, you, you with me so far? All right. See the line? Now, with that line, let's say you had a pen, and you go to this line, and arbitrarily, anywhere on the line, you scratch, put a little scratch on that line. Okay, make a little scratch. Just a scratch. Well, that scratch is our life in the scope of eternity. Now, anyone with any sense in the world would live that scratch, that life in light of the line, right? But we don't. You know what we have a tendency to do? We have a tendency to make that little scratch everything. We lead scratch lives with scratch attitudes and scratch goals and scratch priorities. And as a result, we barely make a scratch of a difference with our life. That's why we don't see the opportunities that God often brings us. Well, the opportunity for Esther was very clear. She was asked to use her influence or her position to respond to a potential genocide of the Jewish people. Now, you would think that whenever God offered an opportunity to do something that significant, man, the answer would be an automatic yes, wouldn't you think? In fact, I hear this all the time, and perhaps you've said it yourself. If God would just tell me what to do, I'd do it. If God would just tell me what he wants me to do with my life, if God would just make that clear, man, I'll be all over that. If God would just simply reveal that to me, I'll be all in on that. Really? Are you sure? Because when presented with God's opportunity, with God's calling and purpose, the truth of the matter is what I've seen and what you have witnessed as well, is that most people don't stand up and, and they're not counted. They resign and they remain behind. Why? Here's why. Because with every opportunity comes something else. With every opportunity comes with this. A price tag. See, whenever we come face to face with an opportunity to do something significant with our lives, we will also be confronted with the sacrifice that is involved with doing what God has asked us to do. So the first key in making a difference, in making history with our lives, is to see and seize the opportunity God gives us. But the second factor is we must see the cost, count the cost, without counting us out from it, with it. It was no different with Esther. See, there was a little rule back in the days of Persia that no one could go before the king just so, at least not uninvited, not unscheduled, not unappointed. Because if you did, the, it was considered a capital offense, and the punishment was capital as well. They'll kill you for it. So what Mordecai was saying to Esther was this, hey, hey, we're in a perilous situation, but I got an idea. I got a plan. It's a suicide mission, but at least it's a plan, Right? That's what he presented to Esther. And how did she respond? Let's go back to the passage, verse 9. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. And then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. 
But 30 days have passed since I was called to the king. Go to the king. Did you catch that last line? Esther understood the problem. Esther understood the need. Esther saw the opportunity. But she also saw the staggering cost that was hers if she got involved. And she discloses some potential marital issue here, right? Because it's been 30 days since she got together with the king. There was no contact whatsoever. Let me ask you, ladies, if you haven't been in contact with your husband for 30 days, would you be wondering, hey, are we okay? Right? 30 days. So Esther's like, I have no idea where I stand with the king. I could lose my throne. I could lose my title. I could lose the privilege, my money, my prestige, all the perks that go with it. <laughs> but that's not even half of it. I could lose my life. And that brings us to the choice that Esther made. He see, if we're going to make history with our lives, we need to choose to pay the cost. See, just about every person who gave themselves over to God in such a way that made a difference in the world, they will tell you there was a moment in their lives where they had to, to, to commit to giving, making the sacrifice needed. Because they'll tell you there was a moment where everything was on the line. Which is why most people live scratch lives. Because the one thing that most of us are averse to doing is making a sacrifice. See, we count the cost, and if it's too much, we let the cost count us out. We see the price tag, the risk, the inconvenience, and we, we don't say this out loud. Don't, don't get me wrong. We say this more internally, maybe to maybe a person or two at the most, but this is what we typically say inside. Are you serious? I'm not about to do anything that would affect my quality of life. Take a risk. I mean, during, have you noticed the time right now? Why would I risk anything of having less than what I have now in this crazy economy, in this crazy world that we live in now? What? Add something else to my schedule? What? Put my reputation on the line? you got to be kidding me. What? i got to deal with who? i got to go through what struggle? What are you thinking? No, no, no. It's, don't get me wrong. Sure, I want to make a difference, but come on. Not at the cost of sacrifice. Like I said, we don't say this stuff out loud. But if we're really honest, such thoughts do creep in, don't they? Don't they? But what if there's no significance without sacrifice? What if there are two sides of the same coin? It's not incidental that the place of the cross the place of the world's redemption and salvation is also the place of greatest sacrifice where Jesus spilled the sinless blood for all of our sins so anyone who believes in him will never have to die, be separated from God, but have personal relationship and have eternal life. See, the place of sin Salvation was a place of greatest sacrifice. And here's the reality. Significance and sacrifice are forever intricately intertwined. They go hand in hand. I remember hearing about William Borden. In fact, his life is told in a very simple, simply titled book, Borden of Yale. <laughs> William Borden, uh, he's a man who went to Yale University many years ago. And if the name Borden sounds a little familiar, you see, he was the heir to the Borden Dairy Estate. How many of you heard of Borden Milk? That, it's that family, okay? And by the time he was a graduate in high school, he was already a millionaire. And back then, millions actually meant something. 
<laughs> and as a graduation gift, Borden was sent on a, tri a trip around the world. He traveled through Asia, the Middle East, and Europe, and he, and he experienced all kinds of things. But the thing that really resonated with him is that he recognized the incredible hurt that many people had. He recognized so many who did not know Jesus. And while still on the trip, William Borden wrote to his parents, said, I do not want to take over the family business. In fact, I'm going to give my life to prepare for the mission field. You see, he wanted to tell the world about Jesus who can make a difference in the lives of those who are hurting and are lost without him. So after making this decision, here's what he wrote. In the back of his Bible, he wrote two words there. And he wrote, no reserves. No reserves. From there, he went to Yale University, but with the purpose and determination of being a missionary. And during his first semester, he began a movement among the students, to, you know, simply where students would come together and get this, John Michael. He just got together, they talked about the Bible, and they decided to pray. That was it. And by the time, at the end of his freshman year, 150 Yale students met weekly for the purpose of understanding what the Bible says, and praying to Jesus. And by the time he was a senior, a thousand out of the 1,300 Yale students <laughs> were part of weekly joining. See, beyond the campus, Borden founded the Yale Hope Mission to reach out to those streets, pe people who lived in the streets, and to care for them. But he did it all with a sense of his calling, for his purpose, for his his. his, his seizing the moment of being a missionary, which was clarified to be toward the Muslims in China. After graduation, you can imagine someone with his name and someone with his credentials, all manner of opportunities flooded him. All manner of high-paying jobs, and he declined each and every single one. And it was at that point that he went back to the back of his Bible, and underneath the words, no reserves, he also wrote two more words, no retreats. Well, after graduating, like I said, he went to Princeton to become an ordained minister. And when he finished his studies in Princeton, he set sail for China. And while he stopped in Egypt to study the language to become an effective missionary, he contracted cerebral spinal meningitis. And in less than a month, William Borden was dead. He was 26 years old when he died. But before he died, because he knew his days were short while he was in Egypt, he went to the back of his Bible and wrote two more words. See, beneath no reserves, beneath no retreats, he wrote these two words, no regrets. How does a story like that hit you? Do you see his life as a waste? Oh, what a tragedy for someone to die so young. Or, or does something stir within you? Do these thoughts come to the forefront of your mind saying that that is a life truly lived? What if the truth is that such a life is indeed the kind of the life that is most consequential in the world? What if such lives are the lives that are celebrated in eternity? Because I know such lives they teach us an incredible lesson. And one of the lessons is simply this. If you lead a safe life, you will never live a significant life. Furthermore, the lesson is that the duration of your years mean nothing. It's what you do with the years that you have. That a life that ends at 26 could be more consequential and more celebrated in heaven than a life of 126. See, 
How does that story hit you? See, Esther was given an opportunity, a Kairos moment by God. But facing the cost, wrestling with the reality of the sacrifice that would be involved, what was she going to do? Here's what happened next. Verse 12 says, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he went back, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But if you and your families, you and your father's family will perish. And this is a powerful line, powerful question. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And the third component of a life that makes history includes the challenge and stepping up to that challenge. For you see, Mordecai didn't mince words, did he? <laughs> well, he shouldn't have. After all, the stakes were high. Annihilation of the Jewish people were at stake. History was going to be made one way or another. And so Mordecai, in essence, kind of got in Esther's face, right? And kind of laid it out there. This is your moment. Are you going to do something significant or not? Because if you don't, God is still sovereign, and he will search the land and find someone who will. Someone who will refuse to shrink, will refuse to be silent, but speak up for the Lord and for, his, for the good of the people and for the glory of the Lord. God will get that done. But right now, recognize it could be you. And it's a message that is before you today. It could be you. It could be you. Right now. See, there will be makers of history in our day. There will be, that God will raise up someone to do it. The question is whether or not it will be you or me. See, that's the challenge. See, there is a spiritual struggle going on in our society. At the root, it's spiritual. There is a struggle between good and evil. There is a right and there's a wrong. And there is a heaven and there is a hell. And people are really going to spend their eternity in hell without Jesus. Because eternal consequences are at stake in this moment. In fact, you may not even be a Christ follower yet, but the invitation is still before you. <laughs> See, there are people, and I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way. You're not even a Christ follower yet. But the lives to whom you impact are waiting on you to know Jesus so that they can know Jesus, so their lives will be impacted, so that they can make a difference and make history with their lives as God intended for them. And he's waiting on you to step up this challenge and become a Christ follower today. There are others of us who are already Christ followers Come on. What are you going to do with the challenge? What did Esther do? Did she blow it off? Was she momentarily stirred by the moment? Or was she deeply transformed? Listen to her words. Verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Verse 16 says this. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. What a response. <laughs> and because of a response. She made history. 
Let me tell you how it played out for Esther. See, when she went to the king, she was, I'm sure she was trembling. I'm sure inside she was afraid because she was fully expecting to lose her life. But she found out that not only did she, the king not kill her, when she explained to the king what was really going on, the king killed Haman instead. Instead of Mordecai being remained in a lowly state, the king elevated Mordecai to Haman's honorable position. And as a result, the Jewish people were saved. A people that would one day produce a person named Jesus who would later become, who is the savior of the world. It's not a bad day's work, is it? The question is, how will you respond? If I perish, I perish. I know that this message is kind of challenging, and I don't mean to make it any more negative because I hope that it's inspiring instead. But let me share with a reality that is true for each and every one of us. All of us are going to perish one day, right? It's just a matter of when. The question is, what will we give our life for? What will we give our life for? See, when we're willing to step up to the challenge, that's when history's made with the Lord beside us, in us, and through us. Years ago, in fact, it's the fourth century, there was a monk by the name of Telemachus. He lived a cloistered monastery kind of life, and, but he sensed that God was calling him to go to Rome. So in obedience, he went to Rome. And so as he started into the Roman streets, he traveled there and got packed up his stuff. He noticed that the crowd was ushering into this location. He just kind of followed with the crowd because it was, they were so excited. And, and he realized that he was heading to the Colosseum. And in the Colosseum, he witnessed these gladiators who pledged their life to Caesar and to death for the entertainment of the crowd. And Telemachus was going, whoa, whoa. This isn't right. This can't go on. He was just in utter shock. He didn't know what to do. All he knows is he was just, just responsive to this terrible situation. The crowd was cheering and they were having a good time. Gladiators began to fight. And Telemachus just, just in response found himself going to the edge and screaming out, In Christ's name, stop. In Christ's name, stop. He jumped over into the arena. He went in between the gladiators upon which the crowd kind of thought it was, wow, something new to the entertainment. And so they, they loved it. But he stood between the gladiators saying, in the name of Christ, stop. In the name of Christ, stop. Well, the crowd kind of got bored with that for a bit. And so they just started this chant, run him through, run him through. And one of the gladiators, listening, you know, took his shield and knocked him away, and, and he just tumbled to the ground. But he got right back up and said it again. In the name of Christ, stop! Run him through. Run him through. Until that actually happened. A sword went through Telemachus. And he laid on the ground. And with his dying breath, said once again, in the name of Christ, stop! And one of the gladiators paused because he knew this moment was different. Both of the gladiators paused. And all the crowd in the Colosseum recognized there was a different moment going on. See, in the crowd of 80,000 people, a hush fell over until people in the back of the Colosseum began to stand up and started to leave. And some more and more and more until the Colosseum was empty. And Telemachus 
because of what he did marked the last time anyone would die for entertainment in the Colosseum. That's when the, glad when the gladiatorial fights ended in the Colosseum. All because Telemachus, in the name of Christ, responded. See, Telemachus made a difference because he refused to be silent for the good of Jesus, for his glory. And he brought about good in the world. And the reality is so can we. So can you with your life today. We can be agents of God's plan. He's doing something amazing. If we will see the opportunity, count the cost without letting it count us out, and stepping up to the challenge. Or we could do what perhaps many of us have done before. We could hear about the message and go, wow, wasn't that nice? And go to lunch. And by the afternoon, forget about the message. And maybe next week we can go, hey, let's see what else the Bible has to say next Sunday. And to that, let me just say one thing. In the name of Christ, stop. Let's stop it. Let's stop saying, well, I'll wait until I get my life right with God. Let's stop saying, I'll wait until I seek him and his word. Let's wait. Let's stop saying, let's wait until later. Let's, let's stop saying, let's let, let someone else do it. In the name of Christ, stop. Because let me tell you something. Time is too short the days are too dark, and the call of Christ is too clear for us to just wait and be silent. History is waiting for you. Will you step up to the challenge? Let's all stand as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us the wonderful privilege of accepting your invitation to know your son Jesus, to live our lives reflecting him and sharing him to the world. Help us to stand for him, to follow him with no reserve, no retreat, with no regret. In Jesus' name.